Welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Howard Coe and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this very exciting studio event entitled, What's It Like to Work in the U.S. Government and Insider's Perspective? And to address that question, I'm really proud to be joined by four esteemed colleagues in academia who have all previously held high level positions in government. And you're gonna really enjoy this really insightful exchange I'm gonna guarantee for the next half hour. So my colleagues are to my immediate right, Professor Sarah Bleich, who um, was the senior policy advisor for nutrition in the Obama administration, and also led efforts at the US Department of Agriculture, USDA, for COVID and nutrition security in the Biden administration. And then next to Sarah, Dr. David Blumenthal, who led health IT efforts at the US Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, in the Obama administration. That included a historic investment in data infrastructure. He's now a professor of the practice here at the Harvard Chan School. Uh, to David's right, Dr. Rochelle Olensky, the immediate past director of the CDC <laughs> through the COVID pandemic during the Biden administration. And while there, she also launched a major reorganization of the CDC. She is now a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, the Harvard Law School, and Harvard Business School. And then last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Ben Summers, who evaluated evidence uh, regarding health coverage expansion and related programs as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, ASPE, in the Biden administration. He's a professor of health economics here. And I am the former U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health in the Obama administration, and so we're all very pleased to be with you today. And as I begin, let me acknowledge the tremendous support of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn Forum Series. The Cohn family is here today, and we want to thank you for making this possible. And then, of course, we welcome everybody here in the studio and online. So let's begin with a brief introduction. In a line or two, can each of you give us the highest level description of the position or positions you had in government? So we can all get familiar with that. And then tell us what motivated you to give federal service and public service a try. So Sarah, do you want to start? Sure, thank you. And it's great to be on this panel. So in the Obama administration, I was a White House fellow and served as a senior policy advisor to the Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Service, and then went back in the Biden administration first as a senior advisor for COVID and then as director of nutrition security and health equity. And I'm actually an accidental federal servant. <laughs> I went into it because I wanted to understand how the sausage got made. I wanted to understand the the secret ways that policy comes to life, and I fell in love with government. I thought I would hate it. I thought it'd be bureaucratic and slow, but it'd make me a better researcher. And I walked away, and I don't know of another place where you can impact people's lives at scale than federal government. And so for me, I'm a total convert, um, and I think it's one of, it's been those two tours of duty I've done so far have been two of the most <coughs> rewarding of my professional career. Thank you, Sarah. Great way to start. David? Uh, so, <clears throat> Thank you, Howard, and uh, it's, great for, it's great to be here. So I was a, trained as a physician and practiced uh, for much of my career, but uh, I remember vividly where I was when I heard about John F. Kennedy's assassination because he was a great model for my generation. And I always admired leaders in government and wanted to serve in government. So I designed a career around health policy and around creating opportunities to work in government. And when I got the chance to do so, I was not disappointed. It was a terrific experience, uh, one that enabled me to have impact at scale that was never gonna be possible practicing medicine one-on-one. -on -one. Not that that's not important or valuable, but for me, uh, given my policy interests and my aspirations, serving in government was a unique opportunity. Thanks, David. Rochelle? Great. Delighted to be here, and thanks also to the Cone family for making this possible. Um, I uh, never envisioned a, a career in government at all. Um, it was a job that I never aspired to or never really even applied to. Um, I served as the director of the CDC, which is responsible for the health, safety, and security of all Americans. Um, and uh, through, through their work domestically and internationally. Um, I received a phone call from Ron Klain in the middle of the pandemic while I was serving as Chief of ID at Mass General um, saying, would you be interested in being our CDC director? 
Um, I never expected a phone call, and um, I had a lot of a lot of internal thoughts. Um, among them was, "This is going to be the hardest thing that you're ever going to do," um, and the other was, "It's." December 2020 and 3,000 people are dying every single day and um, somebody is calling you because they think you can help. I, in my nomination speech I, I compared it to the carrying the code beeper when you're a senior resident. If the code beeper goes off you don't think about whether you can handle what's on the other side of the code, you run to the code. And so that's sort of how I felt that my, my code beeper for the country was going off and the country was coding and my job was to run. So that's where I went. And just to clarify, Ron Klain at the time was chief of staff to the president. So okay. he was the chief. He was intending to be the chief of staff okay. of the elected president. Got it. <laughs> okay, good, 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 great, super. And then Ben. Uh, so I, I'm a, a health economist and a primary care doctor by by background. And when I was at at HHS, I led the office of, of assistant secretary for planning and evaluation, which is essentially the in-house think tank for the Secretary of Health and Human Services, trying to provide research and evidence to drive decision making for all of the issues that come across uh, the portfolio of Health and Human Services, which is really broad. I spent the first year there leading the Office of Health Policy, and then the second year I was asked to um, uh, temporarily be the leading official for, for, the, for the whole office across all of our policy areas. And uh, the reasons I, I did it, I think one was because when, uh, when you're a policy researcher and, and you're, you're doing research, your goal is to inform policy and, and help evidence get into practice. What better way to do that than being right there in the decision-making conversations and able to say to those making these really important uh, um, choices that will affect millions of people's lives, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's what we, we recommend. And so that was a really uh, powerful opportunity in terms of putting research into practice. And then the other is, someone like Rochelle said with the pager, uh, as I left my primary care practice, I, I saw one of my um, longest term patients and, and I told him what I was doing and that I, I was having to leave practice. And he was a veteran, he said to me, Doc, when you get called to serve, you serve. Uh, <laughs> and and there, was, there was certainly that, that uh, ethos as well. Yeah, these are very compelling uh, testimonies, so thank you. And for me, it's very similar to what you've heard from my colleagues. It's, it's a call that you get and it's a call that you must meet and can't ignore. Uh, when people ask me how I got involved in all this, I often think of my late father, who was the uh, ambassador from South Korea to the United States in his day. So be, when people ask me to reflect on how this all began for me, I say it's in my blood. <laughs> it really came for, from my dad. Uh, and he also encouraged um, me and all my siblings to be broad like the sky. That was something he used to tell us kids. And so by becoming assistant secretary, I certainly got my wish. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was back uh, with the previous pandemic, H1N1. And then just as that quieted down, the Affordable Care Act was passed into law and we were off and running. So when you're the assistant secretary for health in a position like that, you get to touch just about every aspect of the department with respect to those themes and public health efforts and tobacco and opioids and obesity and many other places and also serve as the senior advisor to uh, the secretary with respect to public health. So it's been quite a ride and like my colleagues, something that stays with you forever. It, it just changes your life in ways we're, we're gonna be talking about in just a second. So uh, let me start now with Ben for the next question. What, what are some of the differences working in government that you discovered as opposed to working as a professor in academia or being a clinician taking care of patients? I think one of the most notable differences was just how hierarchical it is. Uh, everyone has their role. You have this kind of sprawling bureaucracy and uh, making sure that you're talking to the right person at the right level, uh, that you're, you're understanding who you're supposed to talk to, who you're not supposed to talk to, uh, who needs to, to communicate at a, you know, at maybe at a, a, a staff supporting level, when does this leadership get involved? So there was a, definitely a learning curve there. And, and the other piece was I was appointed, I was a day one appointee, which meant that President Biden was sworn in at around noon, and about 15 minutes later, I and nine other officials for, were the only political officials for, for the huge department of HHS. Mm -hmm. Now it's probably around 200 political officials have been appointed. Right. But in that first day, that first afternoon, uh, you have to realize that you have a staff, uh, in, in my case it was 140 people in this office that I was working in, who were career officials who hours earlier had had a completely different boss, namely the <laughs> president, President Trump, the previous president, and Pre Secretary Azar, and different leadership within the office. And so that's a huge amount of whiplash, uh, change in priorities, change in focus, change in culture and style, and trying to make those connections with your team to, to 
do the work that you need to do, but also just be aware of what a change it is, uh, and so quickly. Fascinating. Yeah, those change of administrations is something that I think people on the outside don't really appreciate very much, but when you're on the inside, oh my goodness. <laughs> and you have to deliver, right, on, starting on day one. So thank you for your service there, Ben. Uh, Sarah, you want to go next on this one? So I would just add to the point about starting off on day one. So like Ben, I started on inauguration, so there was like a handful of us at USDA. And I think the biggest difference between an academic life and federal service is academic life is very predictable. Government service is not. And so my <laughs> my my inbox just starts populating and, and meetings just start popping on the calendar. You gotta be 15 different places at once. You lose total control of your ability to manage your day. <laughs> and that is probably one of the most striking things. That and the need to always speak um, the, always, oh, the need to always not get ahead of the president, the always to always stay in line. You can't say what you think. You have to say sort of what the administration thinks. And that's a very different orientation if you're a professor, where you sort of say what you think. And that is one of the biggest differences I observed. Yeah, the unpredictability factor. I, I remember coming back and being amazed that you could start a class at 10 and it would end at 11 <laughs> and that there would be no interruption in between <laughs> because uh, you're in government. Those, those meetings get interrupted all the time with uh, all these contingencies. So, uh, David, you want to comment more on this? <clears throat> so I, I guess I neglected to say that my job was national coordinator for health information technology and I was charged with basically wiring the American healthcare system, making sure that every <laughs> doctor and hospital had an electronic health record. Actually, the way President Obama described it somewhat inaccurately was that by 2014, this was in 2009, every American would have an electronic health record. Uh, and uh, I had $3 billion in discretionary money to, toward that, and then I was responsible with others for writing regulations that would distribute another $30 billion. Uh, so it was a big, prominent job. And I guess one of the biggest differences between service in the private sector and the public sector is the level of scrutiny if you have a position of responsibility and if you have $33 billion to, uh, to work with, you are going to be a magnet for press attention. Uh, and so I thought the level of media scrutiny I had to deal with somewhat surprised me, but I understood it. Uh, and the level of oversight from other officials, especially in the Office of Management and Budget and the White House. Uh, and it took me six months to convince them that I was not incompetent um, <laughs> and that they should let me do my job. Uh, but once they did, I had a lot of autonomy. And it was that level of autonomy that was both striking and rewarding uh, as I got uh, more, as I built trust with the Secretary's Office, with the Office of Management and Budget, the, and with the executive office of the president. Thanks, David. And Rochelle, I'm sure you can relate to all these things, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, much of, much of my comments have been said, but maybe I'll expand on a couple. One is the whiplash of a new administration. And I often found it striking how careers could actually literally change boss every four years or maybe every eight. And with that, like a massive shift in priorities. Um, and that they then had the responsibility to shift in those priorities. Um, of course, there was media. I mean, there was there was so much media. <laughs> we can have a conversation about that, but there was a lot of media attention. And then I think maybe one piece that hasn't been mentioned yet is the importance of network. Um, and I really knew the infectious disease. I could find you an infectious disease doc anywhere in this country and probably around the world based on my network before going into government. That network was important. But I didn't have a network at the White House. I didn't have a network at HHS. I didn't have a network in Congress. I didn't have a network in the media. And I didn't have a network in state and local health departments. Um, and building those networks and recognizing that as a director of CDC, you're actually responsible to all of those places and all of those people. And not knowing, they, people will take your call, which was wonderful. But the question was, would they trust you? And until they trust you, it was really, really hard, especially in a time where science and data were moving so quickly. I mean, it was January of 2021. Incredible. Yeah, and I think I can add to these comments as a physician and clinician. Some, several of my colleagues are physicians and clinicians here too. But I've often reflected that when you're a clinician and doctor, you care for some patients some of the time. But when you enter positions like this, your goal is to try to care for 
all people all the time. And you know, when you're a clinician, you take care of people you see, but then when you're in these government positions, you, you try to care for all people that you'll never see. So that shift is a, a fascinating one to, to live through. And uh, I respect all my colleagues here who have, who have gone through that. So let's move on to uh, what surprised you about federal service. And what surprised you that in hindsight was something that everyone should know. So uh, David, you want, you want to start with that one? So there are a lot of things that surprised me, but one of them was the quality of the people mm -hmm. in federal service. Mm -hmm. There were, uh, I think, people in the private sector, especially in this country, have an incredibly distorted, unfortunate view of the quality of the people who serve them in federal government. But uh, the, the incredible competence and the dedication of the people I worked with, many of whom had no more than college degrees, unlike this environment where we are used to being seeing people who are multiply credentialed, like many of us on this panel. These are people who were just very, very good at what they did and did, served unselfishly for much less money than they could earn and were dedicated to public service. Uh, and I think that that is an incredibly, it's a jewel mm -hmm. that the American public do not appreciate. Thanks, David. I think we'd all agree to that. Uh, Rochelle, you want to? Um, I would on? completely echo that. There are extraordinary people in government who, having now been there, I've had this great gift of getting to know and now calling my colleagues and friends. Um, I was shocked at the frailty of the public health infrastructure in this country. I um, knew it to be frail, um, and yet I was still stunned at how frail it was and how, and it is, and how difficult it was to make a good decision because you were not getting state-of-the-art data in order to inform that decision, or that the, the public health infrastructure, the laboratory infrastructure, the data infrastructure, the workforce, all of those things were as frail as they are and the investments that are really required. And then maybe finally, and this speaks a bit to what David was saying, is you know, oftentimes it's easy on the outside to say, why hasn't the government done X? Why hasn't the CDC done Y? They should do this, they should do that. And, and generally there's a team of really smart people who agree with you, we should, and there's generally a reason why. And it's actually a pretty good reason why. And so there are, we need to have more of those dialogues. What looks like would be obvious from the outside, there's generally a good why as to why it's so difficult um, when working from the government side. Uh, so David stole mine, I think. Uh, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't surprise me. I spent some time in government about 10 years ago, but I think it is something that the general public just doesn't necessarily appreciate and, and you know, the, the, the true commitment that people in government bring to their job and, and what they're trying to accomplish. I guess the other thing that's maybe a little more distinctive to the office that I was working in was I, I was pleasantly surprised at how much interest there was in good data and evidence. Uh, so I, you know, sitting in leadership meetings where where someone would ask and say, well, do we do we know? You know, do we do we have answers to those questions? What will, what will happen if we do this policy? We often think that all of government is political, and certainly politics are a big piece of it. But uh, folks wanted to know. They wanted to know the best estimates. They wanted to understand what what we thought the research would show. And so that was, uh, I think, really uh, gratifying for the kind of work that our team was doing, and and also encouraging that there there is a place for evidence based policy. Right. And Sarah. Well, total plus three on career staff. They're amazing. But I would say um, my first tour of duty, I was really surprised by the pace. Again, I thought government would be slow and boring, and it was so quick and interesting. And the part of that is being a political appointee versus career staff, and you're sort of in a different, um, a different set of people that you're working with. But the pace really stood out to me, and I loved it. I would say second tour of duty in the Biden administration, what really stood out was how nimble government could be. I mean, if you were on the front lines of COVID, which Michelle certainly was, like papers would come out and government policy would change. And that really tells you the role of evidence um, for the ability to drive policy. And I, I went into government thinking, what role does science actually have in policy making? And I left realizing that it really can play a critically important role and it can happen quite quickly if it needs to. All fascinating comments. I endorse uh, every thought uttered by my colleagues here. I think what surprised me, and I was the state health commissioner before I was in federal government was the obvious now in hindsight is that when you take on these jobs, you are on stage. <clears throat> public health leadership is public. So everything you do or say is open to comment and 
criticism or agreement or disagreement, and so that's what the job is all about. And you have to you have to get used to that. I, th I think one example for me is when I was in academia and as a clinician, the fact that I was uh, I am Asian American was sort of a mild curiosity. But when I took on both my state job and my federal job, the fact the fact that I was the first Asian American to hold those posts really, really got a lot of attention. So uh, it made me think personally about what my job was to do in these roles and um, how I could leverage who I was to support communities and particularly underserved communities. So all that rolls into serving in these posts in, in just a fascinating way. Uh, so Rochelle, you already mentioned working with the media. Uh, and we all have to work with the media and advocacy groups in, in uh, these roles. Uh, you work so closely with the press. Um, do you want to just comment on that and how uh, we can all work better with the media when we're having very important positions like yours? Yeah, thank you. So maybe just to kind of give you a sense of what we went into, it was January 20th. I was also one of the first sworn in. I was on the screen with these folks um, early on. CDC at the time, CDC director at the time, was not a Senate confirmed position, although it, that has since changed. Mm -hmm. um, so the plan was three times a week press conferences under the White House banner. And that's what we did. We did about 100 of them um, three times a week. Um, my, <laughs> my CDC, my director of comms position had been empty for four years prior to my um, arrival. That, that position had been filled. We had four acting people in it for about two years before we were able to fill that position. That's what it was. One of the lessons that I learned, interestingly, was by virtue of being under the White House backdrop, which was important. People had said, well, that makes it political. But it was very important that people like me and Vivek and Tony and Jeff Zients at the time, the COVID czar, were all saying the same thing. There was such a move to try and split us mm -hmm. that having the same banner saying we were saying the same thing, we were all united, we were all aligned in what the right thing was to do. And trust me, nobody would have been there if we weren't that that was really important. But what that White House banner meant is that we were talking to White House reporters. And the details of public health often go to the scientific reporters that weren't necessarily in those press conferences. And so we did a lot of work in sort of filling in the pieces for um, the science that was the reason why we would make a policy or release something or data that weren't necessarily obvious to a White House reporter but might have been obvious. To a, to a health reporter, for example. The other piece that I just want to comment on is the media's need for controversy. Mm -hmm. um, and that became really difficult because there could be a hundred things that we agreed on, and if there was a hundred and the hundred and first, um, was gray, but somebody needed to make a decision, the media would hone in on that hundred and first one. And that really meant a very difficult, that we had a very difficult time in unifying and saying, actually, there's a hundred things that we agree on, um, and these things are really important. Um, that became really challenging. Thank you, Rochelle. Ben, you want to comment on media or advocacy? Yeah, I think. Uh, you know, to a, a one one thousandth degree of what Rochelle experienced, I, I think I did have some ex sense of, of the shift of being in government when talking to media because reporters that I had talked to regularly as a professor you know, here would, would now reach out and the conversations were quite different. As a, as a Harvard professor, the general approach was that uh, media were grateful and eager for your expertise and input. And in government, it was, what are you trying to pull over me? <laughs> right? so, so you had to kind of just True. adapt and try to say, well, look, I'm still trying to give you evidence-based <laughs> answers, but, uh, but I, I recognize I'm speaking in a different role now. I guess the, on the positive side, a lot of the work that we did in, in, in our office was trying to marry data with outreach and public education in a way that could be useful to our policy goals. So I did a lot of work uh, with our team around coverage expansion efforts, trying to get more people signed up for Medicaid, more people signed up for health insurance through the marketplaces. And to do that, we really had to educate them about a bunch of the, the changes in the law related to the pandemic and also the um, subsidies available th through the uh, American Rescue Plan. So we work really closely with both our regional offices from the government government, but also community partners and uh, advocacy organizations to help them understand what, uh, what policies were in place, what opportunities there were for gaining coverage. And we did similar work around vaccine outreach, 
uh, we segued into doing that around prescription drugs and some of the uh, coverage provisions in Medicare. So providing good information, but then communicating it through community partners so that the people who actually would benefit from these policies understood them and could take advantage of them. So th it's not all uh, uh, the glass half empty. I mean, a lot of those interactions are really positive to making sure the public knows, knows how policy can, can improve their lives. Thank you. Sarah? Um, nothing to add. <laughs> okay, that's all been said. All right, David. Any more on media? So, and have yeah. So, um, I uh, we should all acknowledge that Rochelle had the by far, by far, the most difficult and challenging and important job of relating to the media. I had a particular experience. I, I should say that I was a undergraduate college newspaper editor at a, <laughs> at a, at a little known college in Cambridge. Um, and um, so I had an instinctive sympathy for the press and a respect for them because a lot of my college classmates had gone on to be very prominent journalists. And I deeply respected the media for that reason. And I was fully prepared to deal with them. And, and uh, I deeply believed that if the Congress was going to give me a lot of money to spend, uh, that I should be held accountable, and the media was one way to hold me accountable. What I wasn't prepared for was investigative reporters. Uh, because there was money in my office, some reporters approached this as just assuming that there was corruption. And within about two weeks of my taking the job I took, uh, I got a call at 5 o'clock one afternoon from a Washington Post investigative reporter saying that the next day there would be a piece running about <clears throat> my connections to the electronic health record industry <laughs> and whether I had uh, inserted into Obama's, because I'd worked for Obama as a health advisor on his campaign, whether I had inserted uh, a, uh, hit the electronic health record agenda into his platform, which I had. Uh, because I was basically on the take from the electronic health record industry. That ran. Uh, it ran basically unrefuted. It was a front page of the Washington Post above the fold when folds mattered it was in the paper world. Uh, and that forever changed my ability to relate to industry, which was a critical component of my agenda. Uh, and that investigative reporter followed me to virtually every public mm. meeting I had for the entire time I was in government. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be, it requires a thick skin. It's worth it. Uh, Rochelle's skin is probably <laughs> 10 foot <laughs> thicker <laughs> than mine. But um, it, was a, it was a trial by fire. And uh, I learned, he was, I should say, completely wrong. I had no connection with the electronic record, uh, industry. And the story went away because of that. Uh, but uh, it gave me second. It gave me some pause about my former colleagues uh, in the media and their level of responsibility at times. Part Thanks. of the job. Next, David. That's quite sorry. Sarah, you, you did have a comment on this. I would just say two things. One is, when asked questions, answer the question that you want to answer, not necessarily what you're being asked. And that's a skill you have to sort of develop over time. <laughs> The other is, I was constantly amazed at how often you have to say the same thing over and over and over again for it to penetrate. And so it may be boring to you, but that rinse and repeat is really <laughs> important for public education. Great. Okay, we're getting close to the end, which I can't believe, but at least one or two more questions. Can you each comment briefly about not only how challenging um, it is, but also how rewarding it is, and if you could summarize in a sentence or two on what you will, you will miss most about public service, but also what you're most glad to have left behind. <laughs> you want to take a, a crack at that? Ben, you want to start with this one? Uh, sure. I mean, I think the, the shared mission and really ability to, to have broad impacts yeah. is what I miss most and, and the most exciting part of that job. Uh, what I miss least I think a combination of, of the schedule and, and just general uh, kind of hectic nature of, of that role combined with, uh, particularly when it was more the administrative features of, of running and working in government as opposed to the policy issues that, that I think motivated all of us to, to sign up, 
my, my eight-year-old said to me on my last day, he says, does this mean you won't be on your phone when you pick me up at school anymore? <laughs> and he was right. And, it, and it, that, I mean, that absolutely is a sacrifice that everybody works in government makes and um, having more time for, for friends and family and other interests is That's a, a point of story. Yeah. Sarah, you want to comment on this? I would definitely say that you get your life back effectively. You can speak freely, which is really nice when you're used to doing that as a, as a professor. So that piece I miss very much. You feel like you're on a very tight leash when you're in government and you're speaking. Or that's how I felt. Um, what I miss the most, very similar to Ben, it's impact. I really don't know of another way where you can change people's lives. And if you're in public health, you're probably there because you want to improve the well-being of people, particularly those who are historically underserved. And even tiny changes in government can have monumental impacts on people's lives. Beautiful. David? Um, what I don't miss is commuting to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I was Howard, on the plane with you a lot. We were on the plane on Monday morning, <laughs> not infrequently. Uh, down you know, early fl Monday morning, back late Friday evening. Uh, <laughs> snow and rain and everything at Logan, <laughs> Logan Airport. Um, so that's one thing I don't miss. I don't miss. Uh, senior White House executives sort of prancing into my work and pronouncing uh, about it, uh, one of whom was a former president of Harvard um, with the initial LS um, and uh, who thought he knew what I, my job better than I did. Um, but uh, but um, I do miss the collegiality of the people and the mission, the commitment to doing the right thing and without a special interest in mind. Uh, just trying to do what was the greatest good for the most people. Thank you. Rochelle? I, I mean, so much of, has been said, but I will say the people have been amazing. I'm still in touch with so many of them. I will miss interacting with them and their scientific expertise and their, their due north mission to do the right thing. Um, the commute to Atlanta was further than DC. <laughs> 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 Uh, the the incessant my phone might go off like you really can't plan anything a calendar that was often booked in the ever fif every 15 minutes um, and I will add one because um, while I, I very much wanted to be accountable I did not love congressional testimony um, <laughs> I testified once prior to being um, at CDC and I was perceived as an expert and was asked questions as an expert. In the 17 times I testified while at CDC, um, you were perceived with sort of nefarious intent. And um, that was just, it was a grueling three hours every time it happened. So final question, a lightning round, and then sadly we'll have to end because it's just fascinating. If you had 30 seconds uh, to give advice to our public health students who are considering a career in public service and or politics, uh, what would it be? Rachelle? Um, yes, please. Invite your friends and then go get in experience um, in government in some way, shape, or form because that experience is really, really helpful when you, when you really start. Thank you. Ben? Uh, it's hard, but it's worth it. It doesn't necessarily have to be for your whole career, but at some point, uh, being able to serve and learning at whatever level of government can just be an incredibly valuable experience for you and in, in terms of what the impact you can have. Thank you. Sarah? Go. Do it. <laughs> have fun. Pick up skills. Make new friends. You will make a difference. Beautiful. And David? All of the above, plus learn how to talk to people who don't understand healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm delighted to have the last word. I think my students know that I encourage all students to give it a try. Even if it's just starting with a summer internship, it'll change your life. It'll make you look at the news in a different way. And as all my colleagues have said, it'll give you a sense of mission that's <coughs> palpable and really so uh, important for all of us personally and professionally. So. I want to thank my wonderful colleagues for a really fascinating conversation. Big round of applause for them. Uh, we should have more of these, right? <laughs> so much more to say. So uh, thank you all for this session. We're going to go now into a little in-studio in version. But uh, thank you so much for attention and look forward to seeing you in the next forum very, very soon. Thank you. <laughs>